Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He's a chronicler of New York, a member of the tribe, a mensch. He's a prize-winning, best-selling novelist, a high school dropout, editor of both tabloids in New York, the Daily News and the Post. He's a forger of the New York alloy. He's a newspaper man. He's Pete Hamill. His new book, Tabloid City, is a story of another newspaper man, Sam Briscoe, and his city. Pete is the author of 20 previous books, including the best-selling Forever and Snow in August and the acclaimed memoir, A Drinking Life. A legendary journalist, he holds the Ernie Pyle Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Society of Newspaper Columnists. He is distinguished writer in residence at New York University. Pete, a pleasure. Let's, let's, let's continue. We, we ended up last week with a discussion of the New York alloy. Let's just continue that a bit. But I really want to talk to you about 9-11 and some of the other reporting that you have done much more recently. Um, alloy. We were talking about what is, what is the alloy and how, do, how is it made and does it continue to be made? I, I think um, when, the way I use it, it's the merging of the different metals that make up various groups in the city into one, uh, an alloy that is tougher than any of the individual alloys. And I think we saw that at its absolute most thrilling best on September 12th, 2001. Go ahead, talk about it. When people that. got up, the city having been hit the hardest blow it had ever suffered, and people got up and they went to work. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't get knocked down. They went down to the site if they, had, if they could to, to help. They went down to help feed the people who were doing the work. Um, but basically, they said, this city did not die on the morning of September 11th. We are here, and we're going to be here a long time. And they came to work, the most important four-letter word in New York history. Um, they came to work. If they had a take bicycles from Sheepshead Bay, they came to work. If they had to walk across the bridges, they came to work. Uh, and I don't mean to work just in the big jobs, but to work at, you know, as short order cooks, as uh, people who serve you coffee in a coffee shop, uh, as messengers, as people doing what I think of as the work of the infantry of New York, mm. the people who help make it work um, and that was a thrilling day for any, anybody who has been here most of his life, his or her life. Go back two days to September 10th, 2011. What, what uh, significant event had occurred in your life? Well, I, that night at 11.20, I finished writing a novel I had been working on for three years called Forever that stretched across the history of New York over a couple of hundred years. And then prior to that, some of Ireland as well. Yeah. Uh, and when I... Um, and the thesis of the, of, of, the, of the pieces or the... The book is a, a guy, uh, for reasons of decency, from a shaman. It's a kind of magical uh, which, premise. Which you've done. Yeah, I, because of a lot of la reading a lot of Latin American yeah, literature. Yeah, it, it, certainly Snow in August. And, and Garcia Marquez. Right. And others, you know, and Bill Kennedy, who's also used right. very effectively the sort of magical realism. Um, and I knew when I got home on September t uh, uh, 11th, because I was there working all day and then 
wrote, filed a story and went back out to see what it looked like at night. When I finally got to bed and my wife was safe and everything else, I realized I'd have to go back and change that novel. And eventually that's what I did. I, I didn't do anything but reporting for weeks. Yeah, and I pulled some of that reporting. I want to talk to you yeah, about it. And I went back then and uh, had to start from the beginning. I couldn't just add on September the, Right, 11th. because the book uh, prior to that, I, I'm tr I was trying to figure out where you, I couldn't buy, exactly figure out where it had ended. But the character, Cormac O'Connor, has got a view of the Trade Center. His girlfriend yeah. works in the Trade yeah, Center. That was all in. That novel. was all in. Yeah. And then, but I was trying to figure out where it broke. So, where are, so you, you finish this manuscript on September 10th. You email, you email your publisher. The following morning, you are where? So the morning I of was September at the 11th. Tweed Courthouse on Chambers Street for a meeting of the Museum of the City of New York. Which uh, never happened, but that's another you, story. We, we had, it, it opened. It, it actually did? started. Because I remember standing with Louis Auchincloss, uh, a, a writer I love, although the two of us couldn't have come from more different world parts of New York and still be New Yorkers. Okay. Um, and we were cracking jokes about how ugly the municipal building was, <laughs> among other things. You that's said, that's a, a uh, uh, yeah. white building. It's <laughs> awful. It's terrible. Uh, and then we sat down and we heard this ka kaboom somewhere. Not a big, heavy Mel Gibson movie blast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, what was that? And he said, just the New York soundtrack, Peter, old boy. And we chuckled and went on with the meeting. And then another 10 minutes went by and somebody came in to say a plane had flown into the World Trade Center. So you're I, only like four blocks away. Yeah, like three, really. Uh -huh. You know. So when I heard that, I ran out and got down to Broadway and Chamber, Chamber Street and Broadway Wow! when the second plane Oof. hit the South Tower with this enormous fireball that, uh, bigger than anything I'd ever seen Oof. of that kind of type. Uh, and people astonished. Uh, and I knew the world had changed. That's when we knew it wasn't some guy getting lost in Teterboro. Mm -hmm. It was uh, terrorism. And uh, like many, many other reporters that day were covering a primary mm. uh, without changing a notebook or yep. a recorder. Yep. We kept doing the real work of that day. And you got separated from your wife. I mean, I mean there, there, there's real drama in this. When the second building went down, there was a, because the second building went down first, mm -hmm. the downtown building, South Tower. The amount of of, uh, of dust and grime and this Valkyrie sound of people screaming that was part of that collapse. And we were together on Vesey Street and started running and a cop was yelling and uh, I, we couldn't see each other, but I thought she was behind me. She thought uh, I was behind her and a cop kept moving her up to Broadway, mm -hmm. and somebody else pushed me into a building on Vesey Street where the New York Post used to be published mm -hmm. years and years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then the door locked behind me in there. And I was with a couple of people I knew, uh, but we couldn't get out the back. They had great barriers on the back to keep burglars out of St. Peter's Church. <laughs> you know? uh, and so we were trapped in there. We didn't know what was next? Because uh, nothing worked, no cell phones. Right, right. And finally a fireman came, realized there were people inside, smashed the glass doors down with an ax and we got out and I was able to run home and checking and you, every and you bus. Live, and you live in Tribeca, right? Yeah. So, so you, within walking, uh, oh, yeah, simple it's, walking, it's like seven walk. blocks. Yeah. And then, and then I went back to the archives. You begin writing an incredible number of, of pieces, starting on September 11th with death, death Takes Hold Among the Living. And then you've got a number of pieces, Smoke and Stench Cannot Mask the Strength to Rebuild, which you alluded to earlier. Then there was a piece on September 19th, 2001, that says, Let a Pork Bloom in the Ruins of the Twin Towers. Obviously, that didn't happen. No. No, I thought, have? A, I thought a park with a tree from every one of the 82 countries that had lost some, some of their citizens 
a place for the kids that are growing up in Battery Park City to come over and play in. Um, maybe we could explain stickball to them, oh. and they would have a real childhood. <laughs> uh, but I didn't think I didn't ball. think of a real estate development. But we'll see what the how it turns out. It's it, it's finally. Uh, yeah, I come in on the climbing into the sky. Yeah, I come in yeah. on the helix from New Jersey, coming yeah. into the into the tunnel, and where there was Bruce Springsteen's Empty Sky, you've got One World Trade Center. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's big and imposing. We'll see whether it's rentable, whether whether we have to subsidize it again, because remember the first Trade Center Oof. was not. Uh, a commercial success. No, I mean so, until Nelson Rockefeller put all the state agencies yeah, in there. Yeah, forget it. It was a, yeah. it was really a, a white elephant. What about downtown? You wrote downtown, and I just been going downtown because a friend moved down to Thirty Nine Broadway, and your your explanation of, of of coming up the Battery, Bowling Green, and then looking at the bowl. And the tourist with the bull, and we, it's too obscene. We can't we do it here. What goes on with that bull? Even, but, even a couple of nuns had a giggle. Oh, <laughs> man. But they're, but they're there all the time. You, your writing, both your fictional writing and your memoirs, both the downtown and uh, A Drinking Life, are really, they're, they're, they're poems to New York. When I think of New York, I think of you, I think of Jimmy Breslin, and I think of Woody Allen. And in a sense, these are sort of my classic New Yorkers. And in, and in some sense, Forever and North River are, you know, Woody Allen's Manhattan. You can hear George Gershwin in the background. What is it that brings you back to New York every time? What is it? Um, to me, it's more like... It's more like the uh, enterprise of Dickens, who did the same kind of thing, who, except it was London mm -hmm. and other, he, he wrote about Italy and other places. And New York it, in the 1840s. Or Faulkner with Mississippi, where you say, I still haven't got this thing right. I, 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 one of my heroes is the great Japanese artist Hokusai, who did the famous giant wave. Right. Which must have been a tsunami, by the way. And Hokusai was one of the greatest draftsmen um, who ever lived in the world of art. And he said when he was 80, if I could get five more years, I would learn how to draw. And I think that, oh. that, that you know, he's a far greater artist than I am, but I, I think that sense is in a lot of writers that I, I admire very much, that they haven't written the definitive account yet. They still haven't caught um, some aspect of the world that they knew better than other places. I, I love being in other countries. I, I think, you know, you can only know a city, whether it's New York or Amsterdam, by walking yep. in it. Uh, Elizabeth Bowen says you only get to know them if you get lost in them and walk your way out. Absolutely, <laughs> you absolutely. Know. But but the combination of the familiar, um, the presence of, the, the verifiable presence of time, that you look at a building and you know that for a hundred years this thing has stood there. I look at the Woolworth building <gasps> and I see the Italian, Fabulous. the Italian stone cutters mm who put the marks on the building, and we don't even know their names, mm. and yet there they are. It's a building you can read. It's a beautiful uh, example of its time, uh, 1913. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I urge, like the kids at NYU, get out of the house. Mm. Walk around. Town. Oh, man. Let your curiosity take over. You see something that's striking, find out it's even easier now, although not particularly accurate all the time, Right on the internet, yep. to at least get a sketch of what it, oh, yeah, of what got, it is. Right, and you gotta, you yeah. gotta get out of Manhattan. Gotta you, gotta, out of you, Manhattan. you gotta walk in, in Queens, you gotta walk in Brooklyn, you yeah. gotta walk in the Bronx, I mean, and there's neighborhood after neighborhood after, yeah. and there are icons 
all over the place. And now, finally, Brooklyn, with you know so many writers living there. Oh man, we're getting Brooklyn that is other kinds of yeah Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah, you know, yeah, different than Pete Hamill's been Brooklyn, yeah. but recognizable but, as Brooklyn. Yeah, to me, I read Jonathan Lethem, and uh, yep. it's not my Brooklyn, but it's Brooklyn. Yeah, I know it's yeah. my Brooklyn, or Colm Tobin. Right, who wrote a book called Brooklyn, right. a novel, a great Irish contemporary writer. I, I read them and I, I say, uh, I didn't see it that way, but uh, here it is. It's, it's something that helps my vision. It helps me to consider other possibilities, not as a writer, just as a, a human being. As some, as yeah. a, you know, yeah. As a human being, the, yeah. the writer human being. Thing, right, so. right. There is a distinction <laughs> often, and some of them yeah. are not, but, that, <laughs> but but some of them are. But as as Cormac uh, kind of finds out here, even if you live forever, you don't you don't know the city. No, you can't you never, know you, it. You can't get no the matter end of what. It. That's why someone asked me once what was the greatest New York novel, and I said the New York Daily News. Yep, good, because it's ongoing. It's continuing. Well, I mean, I would say I would say Crane, but I don't know. But you're right. You're right. There's you know, no I, one oh, way. I can name. You can name great books. Great New York right. novels. From right. Bonfire of the Vanities, wow. backwards. Right. Or forwards, Ooh, perfect. Or call him Tobin's last novel, and you know, there's there's great New York Colin novels. McCann's but novels. There is yeah, no right. One all encompassing right. novel. Right. It's easy to do to do it with Winesburg, Ohio. You right. Yeah. Well, it. thank you. I well, tried to do Rob it Ellis's history is yeah. probably the closest piece of yeah. fictional nonfiction. About about New York, yeah, and, um, and uh, Mike Wallace and his partner, who, yeah, who yeah, Burroughs, right who wrote building. Gotham, yeah. yeah, right in this building. Which era would you, as Pete Hamill, want to go back to? I've got a bet with myself. I think, uh, I, you know, of the and what character? Oh, uh, I just like to be standing on the corner watching it, but I think the Gilded Age would be the mo the richest mm. for a writer. You know, the things are beginning to happen. Electricity is happening. Uh, there's the beginning of cinema is beginning to happen. There, the Edith Wharton's people have run out of money. Um, you know, and as she said somewhere, they raised their children to be useless, and suddenly they're trying to, you know, nice. marry the kids off, the dumb rich guys off, former rich guys. Nice. Off to the guys who run railroads, right, you know? right, and we're getting Andrew Carnegie, and sure, Frick, and all sure. these guys. I think that and Mark Twain's alive, uh, helping us see a, America. A little history. earlier, Tweed. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. Tweed pops up in, in a lot of your fiction, and Tweed seems to be one of those characters that you would really like to have talked to. Oh yeah, I would rather sit around with. Uh, Boss Tweed than Al Gore, you know. What oh, I mean, I mean geez, well, that's <laughs> would, you know. You know, I really would. No, no. I, I, as a matter well, of wouldn't. fact, as a matter of fact, I, under urging from my wife, I have purchased a plot. It's oh, wait a minute! Don't tell me. Not in Greenwood Cemetery. In Greenwood Cemetery. I I knew it. Next to Boss Tweed. I. You know what? I knew it. You've used that cemetery <laughs> in a couple of. I grew up. In that cemetery, when yes. you know, when we played stickball at Frank K. Lane, the cemetery yeah. was right yeah. there. I mean, that is one of the great. I know you got me off. Oh, it's one great. of the great cemeteries. I've I've got a photograph in my office of the Tweed plot. You, yeah, Houdini's that's there. I'm right to the side. You're kidding? Yeah. Oh, so I, least, I knew it. I knew so it. At least when my friends show oh. up, whatever, whoever are left, they'll have a laugh. But also the company will be entertained. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I hope it doesn't happen for a very long time, and I'm old enough to see it. But I'm going to visit in another thirty years. So really, in Gre one okay. Talk about talk about the modern New York City. Talk about Rudy Giuliani and the pieces that you wrote immediately after 9/11, praising him for his behavior in the immediate aftermath, but at the same time recognizing his faults. In your mind, is he still the greatest of New York City mayors? Oh, no, no, I don't think so, no. Who, in your lifetime? Um, I think LaGuardia yeah. is probably okay. still 
and even he failed at a third term. Uh, you know, the third term problem is... Yeah, is, is, yeah well, he wasn't in, interested in it. I mean, yeah. there were other things yeah, on his mind. Yeah, and distracted, and also the, the thing that gave him legitimacy of trying to fight the effects of the Depression and losing, but probably, but losing a decision. Right, right. <laughs> you know, but right. really trying to get it going. Yep. I think he, uh, he and again, I didn't cover him. I, I he actually heard him on the radio. I'm so old, um, the, uh, you know, reading the comics and all that. Huh. But, uh, so you've lived through, I, I'm not going to count them on my fingers, yeah, 10 them, mayors? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, some of them you don't even remember them. But, but what about Rudy? But Talk Gili about Rudy. Giuliani, I think, during the, 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 there was one sentence uh, where somebody asked him um, about the casualties. Yeah. And he said something like, more than any of us can, can bear. bear. I know, it gives and, me goosebumps. And that put the proper note of sorrow into it. It wasn't Giuliani the blusterer. Yeah. It wasn't bring him on. Yeah. You know, like we were getting him. With George Bush. A right. A few days later. Right. Which you called the bogus tough guy yeah, at once. Uh, yeah. A fraudulent tough yeah, guy. I can't stand it. Go ahead. I thought. All the tough guys I knew when I was a kid didn't talk tough. No. They, they were tough. They were tough. They were tough. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think Giuliani made certain mistakes which are uh, terrible. First of all, with the anti-crime thing that John, that Bratton and uh, Jack Maple and other people, Tim, Tim and, and others, yep. um, Giuliani could have taken a bow for b doing more for black New mm. Yorkers because the lives saved by cutting those murders down were essentially uh, lives lost to black on black crime. But he couldn't help not himself. Not exclusively. Right, there was right. Very little black on white crime. There was very little white on black crime. Yep. It was black crack dealers and so on killing each other over control of a corner. Sure. Kids. And he could have taken credit for it, but in his clumsy way, he alienated uh, the black community instead of being embraced by them. A real New Yorker? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, what about Mike Bloomberg? I, uh, th I think he's very competent in the first couple of terms. I think the third term has been a disaster so far. New Yorker? I mean, he's part of E.B. White's New Yorker, but is he in New York? Because every time I hear him, I think Boston Red Sox. There's something, there's, <laughs> there's, there's cognitive dissonance there. Uh, I, n I hadn't thought of it that way. I hadn't thought about him. Was he a New Yorker or not? I, I think it's this new thing in our politics of imports. But Bobby Kennedy, was he a, a real New Yorker? I don't know. Yeah. And I well, liked him very yeah. much. No, and, and then Hillary yeah. Clinton. I mean, in fact, yeah. you did a piece on the templates of New York oh, yeah. and talking <laughs> about, you know, you just can't do it by listening to yeah. it. You have to, you know, live, breathe, and feel yeah. it. Yeah, well, so. that's a journey pump, lady. Right. <laughs> did you ever play Rinalivio and Johnny on the Pony? No, <laughs> she didn't. She didn't play stickball. Now, wait. I can't let you go. Until you please read us this paragraph <coughs> beginning, Stickball Ruled Us. Stickball Ruled Us. On Saturday mornings, the older guys played big games against visitors with other neighborhoods uh, or went off themselves to, <coughs> to play beyond our frontiers. Money games, someone would shout. And suddenly we were all moving to the appointed court in the great noisy fiesta of the stickball morning. The players drank beer from cardboard containers on the sidelines and ate hero sandwiches and smoked cigarettes. They were cheered by neighbors, girlfriends, wives, and kids. And standing on the sidelines during those first games were the veterans holding the Spaldines bouncing them, smelling them in an almost sacramental way. Oh, do you remember the smell of the Spaldings? Yeah. And this was right after the war, obviously. The veterans were coming back. Uh-huh. You know, the ones who lived. One of, one of, one, another one of the themes of Pete Hamill's work is 
and, and, and unfortunately, we don't have the, the two hours necessary to talk about sports and its role in creating this alloy, and particularly baseball and boxing. And we've yeah. only got two minutes, yeah. but go to it. Yeah, I think it was uh, baseball and boxing. Baseball was a sport without a script. We were going to be surprised one way or the other. It didn't, wasn't played against a clock. It could last 25 innings if it had to. Uh, and we believed every single one of them uh, were honest. Nobody was a juicer. Nobody had heard, ever heard of steroids yet. Boxing was a way to, to get the ethnic rivalries out of the way. So that in the end, uh, Stillman's jam, Lou Stillman used to, the phone would ring and he said, Kelly, he said, Kelly? You want the Jewish Kelly or the Italian Kelly? <laughs> You know, there were people were <laughs> right playing for the peanut gallery. There were no other sports. The, they, they existed, but the NBA hadn't really got oh, going. Yeah. Um, you had the Syracuse Nationals, I yeah. know. Uh, and uh, football was a college boys' mm -hmm. game. We we didn't really play football very much. Um, but they were crucial. The the binding elements were sports, the subways. Yeah. Uh, and the papers. Yep. The, they were the things that told people in all parts of the city about each other, about the rivals, about the great uh, compromises that come when suddenly uh, uh, Don Larson pitches a no hitter. Well, poor, we're on the other side. I'm on the other side. And poor Magley. I'm on the other side. Pitches a five hitter. I know. Well, I'm the Yankee fan, so forget <laughs> it. We're going to have to stop here. We've got, uh, come on, you have to come back. Of course. At least another hour. Yeah, Come on. We, we can get a bat and a ball and go. Oh, play. man, we could. Uh, <laughs> let's do stickball. Seriously, do you have any? I'll choose you up. I'm going to call my brother. We'll play. Call Bloom one of your brothers. Yeah, we'll play Bloomberg. <laughs> um, oh, that's that's low. That's low. We could throw left handed. You're a righty, right? <laughs> yeah. Left handed. My thanks to author, editor, newspaper man Pete Hamill for being on the show. His book, Tabloid City, is a great read. And I've had a great time. See you next week, Pete. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.